This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. In the early 2000s, computer animation was revolutionizing the animation industry, and everybody wanted a piece of the action. A lot of folks saw this as a new era, and also an opportunity to get experimental with movies. Personally, I believe that Shrek broke down the door and convinced people that animation can be more than just princess films for kids, that movies can be more spicy with their characters, more serious with their stories, more realistic with their visuals, and overall, just more edgy. But when it comes to experiments, well, you're gonna have some duds. And boy, were there quite a few of those. Battle for Terra, Kena, The Prophecy, Delgo. There were genuine attempts, but many of them were failures. But one movie that I recently discovered from this bizarre era of animation was Back to Gaia. Oops, I'm sorry. I, I meant Boo, Zeno, and the Snurks. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I meant the Snurks. Or all three, all three of them? At the same time? What? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a film with more of an identity problem than this. Like legit, the marketing for this film is all over the place. This DVD cover has this guy as the main character, but this one has this guy as the main character. Then you got this one advertising the movie as a fantasy adventure. But then this one has explosions on the back with a Mad Max car. What? Pick a lane. Seriously, it's all over the place, and I don't know what to make of it. I don't think the folks who made this movie knew how to advertise their film, which is probably why it only made like $3 million at the box office. <sighs> Ouch. But the thing that stood out to me the most were the characters. Like I said, the early to mid-2000s got experimental with computer animation, and in the process, a lot of Uncanny Valley characters were made. Ones that have not aged well at all. Hell, they looked rough right out of the gate. With their eyelashes and their teeth and the pores in their skin. Why do you have the pores in their skin? I don't need to see that. And don't even get me started on the sniffing guy. Trust me, you, you don't want to know about the sniffing guy. <sighs> oh, it's my YouTube's figure that is coming out on February 16th. Let me sniff it again. <laughs> we have fun here. All right, so who are the folks behind this movie? Well, that would be Ambient Entertainment, an animation studio from Germany. Founded in 1999, they got their start making commercials for companies like Volkswagen, but eventually focused their aim at making animated movies. As a matter of fact, The Snurks was the first computer animated movie produced in Germany. <laughs> Such an honor. The Snurks would go on to be distributed by Warner Brothers. But I don't think it had that much of a wide release. Those damn Europeans keeping the Snurks all to themselves. How dare they? Thank you. you. Took one for the team. Needless to say, the Snurks, which was originally called Back to Gaia, didn't do so well financially. Which is why I think the movie started to change its name. It's like, oh, uh, uh, we're, we're not back to Gaia. We're uh, the Snurks. Yeah, that sounds fun, right? It's like they took the Smurfs and the Snorks and fused it together. Reviews for the film were pretty rough, as it has a 5.2 on IMDb and a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. But don't worry, folks. It got Dove approved. You know, that Christian website that gets upset if characters say the H word. Which is weird because Dove approved means that they like the film, but this film has alcohol in it. So that's kind of surprising. You think Dove would be like, no, we don't approve of alcohol in these films. Get them out of there. Meanwhile, Jesus is turning water into wine. Could you imagine that though? If you are going through like a review for VeggieTales, and they're like, be careful of this. The asparagus girl has a huge rack. <laughs> I'm going to hell, aren't I? All right, so what's the movie about? Well, the film starts off with a narrator telling us about a popular television show called The Adventures of Boo and Zeno. Oh my God, another title? 
We then enter the world of Gaia and meet our main characters. Boo, the nerdy coward. Zeno, the heroic meathead. Atlanta, no, not Atlanta, Atlanta, the, the princess who doesn't want to be a princess, but is a princess. And then you have a gang of villains called the Snurks. AKA Joe Pesci, Sonic the Lover Boy, and Fat Guy who only thinks about food all the time. All of them have a big race that goes on for far too long. But then some evil scientist somehow opens a portal to Gaia and steals this sacred relic of theirs called the Dolomite, which sounds way too close to Dolomite. Dolomite is my name and fucking up motherfuckers is my game. I wish it was Dolomite. That would have been a much more interesting film. So in the process of stealing the Dolomite, Boo, Zeno, Alanta, and the Snurks are portaled into the real world, where they discover that they're characters from a TV show. All of them decide to go find the creator of the show, Patrick Stewart, who, get this, essentially tells them that he is their god, and that they all have no free will, and that they're all living a lie. Talk about existential. At the end, we discover that the professor, the guy who stole the Dolomite, is actually a guy called N. Nicely or, or something like that. And he had a TV show that was canceled because of Boo and Zeno. And now he is exacting his revenge by using the Dolomite to power his teleporting technology so he can portal lava through the TV sets of people at home because he's angry at them that they stopped watching his show. Yep, the Gaians stop the professor. Boo is like, oh, I'm gonna stay here on Earth because I have free will here. But then he gets sucked back into Gaia anyway because of some freak accident. But when everybody gets back to Gaia, they're like, oh, we all have free will now. So it didn't matter anyway. And we're not told why they have free will. They just do. And that's the movie. Oh, and don't worry, folks. I'll talk about the sniffing professor here in a bit. You better believe we're gonna talk about this scene. <laughs> Anime figures. So, what are my overall thoughts? Well, let's start with the story. I found it incredibly boring. Long stretches of pointless action and so much screaming. When the Gaians first got to Earth, there was like 20 minutes of them just running around screaming. And it was incredibly annoying. The plot of them discovering that they were TV show characters was also very weak. There was one moment, just one moment, where it could have been interesting. A moment where they truly self-reflect and ask themselves, who am I? What control do I have over my own life? Am I just a trope? But no, they kind of just lightly touch on the subject and then run off to go fight Bill and I, the science guy. If anything, I wish we would have spent more time in Gaia. We got a boring car chase and that's about it. I didn't connect with the show or its characters or the world. So why do I care about getting back to Gaia? The movie would have benefited if it spent more time there. Raise the stakes, make me care about it. For example, there was a Smurfs movie in 2011 that followed the same concept as Back to Gaia. The Smurfs get teleported, they go to New York and have a bunch of misadventures. I did not like that movie, but it makes much more sense with that than it does with the Snurks. I know about the Smurfs. I do not know about the Snurks. Why should I care about them? <sighs> Again, should have spent more time on that. As far as the characters go, nothing special. I did not click with any of them. Xena was annoying. Boo was unpleasant. Atlanta went from being one trope to another. And then the Snurks themselves, which is what the movie's named after, didn't even do that much, outside of getting roofied by a lady who looks like she's from a StarCraft 1 cutscene. I love you, Sarge. Also, there was this awkward love relationship between Atlanta and the snurt guy named Zack, which is very confusing. Like at the beginning, in Gaia, we discover that Zack has a crush on Atlanta. But then when they get to the real world, Atlanta starts to like Zack. Wouldn't it have made much more sense if they were rivals in the show who did not like each other? 
But then when they get to Earth, where they have their free will, they start to fall in love. That would have made much more sense to me and would have been a good way to work with the free will concept. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a floating cartoon guy with no legs. The dialogue was also quite rough and came across as clunky. Zeno screaming his annoying battle cry. To the rescue! To the rescue! To the rescue! Plus a bunch of other pointless exchanges between characters. And there was this one moment where Zeno just turns on Boo. And it came out of nowhere. He was like, you're a coward. I don't like you. Why do I hang out with you? And I'm watching this thinking, where the hell did this come from? They were literally just friends working together a second ago. But now Zeno is screaming at him. Now, the voice acting wasn't bad, but I wouldn't say it was good either. Just serviceable. Which is really a shame, because you have Patrick Stewart in this movie. But man, did he sound dead on the inside. I'm convinced that this line of audio... Oh, so, how do we begin? What should happen? is actually him reading the script about the movie. And the audio guys are like, no, 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 just use that. Keep that in the movie, we can use that. Also, the audio quality sounds odd to me. Like there's this robotic bubble caught in the throat of the characters. I'm having a hard time explaining it, but it's there and it's very distracting. Not really sure where they were going with this decision. And finally, there's the animation. Now, there are some parts that I like, but a lot of it I did not like. Uh, for example, I think the hair physics on Atlanta are quite good. The same can be said for some of the clothing physics and how they interact with the characters. And there's no doubt that motion capture was used for this movie. You can just tell by the movement of the characters, but you can also tell when they don't use mocap because the animation becomes much more slow and clunky especially during the action scenes. But the overall designs of the characters were just meh to me. Just background characters from Jack and Daxter, but with all so incredibly uncanny valley designs. I don't want to see their fully rendered teeth. I don't want to see their somewhat humanoid faces. This stuff rarely looks good, and computer animation still struggles with it to this very day. That's why stylization is the way to go. Don't even try to make these characters look human. It rarely works. Also, don't think I didn't notice Atlanta and how she looks like off-brand Laura Croft. Like, come on. She even looks a bit like Angelia Jolie. But above all else, it's the colors that kill me. This is such a blah looking film with its dull and beige colors. Legit, it's not fun to look at and only adds to the boredom of this film. But hey, at least we have Bill and I, the science guy, sniffing his anime figures. That was like the only time in the movie where I actually cared, cause it was so downright creepy. Why did you have to animate his eyes rolling into the back of his head? Movie, you did not have to do that, but you did. And now we all suffer because of it. In conclusion, The Snurks was a movie that was a valiant effort, but an overall disappointment. I honestly find the concept of cartoon characters discussing their free will interesting, and that could have worked as a main plot, but it was only lightly touched upon in the movie, and they did not drill into it. If it was up to me, I would have made it abundantly clear that these characters from Gaia are essentially tropes. The dumb hero, the cowardly nerd, the damsel in distress. Okay, now they're out of Gaia and can think for themselves and challenge the confines of their pre-established personalities. I don't want to be just a hero. There's more to me than just that. Or I don't want to be just a girl who's a victim. I can fight for myself. To me, that would have been much more interesting. Instead, we got annoying characters who aren't very compelling or endearing and come across as annoying, if anything. Like I genuinely didn't care for a single character in the entire film. And that's a problem. Also, the lack of explaining the show and the world and how that exactly worked was frustrating. How do these characters exist? How does the writer control them? What the actual hell is going on? Oh, uh, no answers. Got it. So when you combine the lackluster story and characters along with dull animation, well, it doesn't make for a good movie. Again, I give them credit for trying to do something different, but it just did not click. And I don't think they ever knew what direction they were going in. 
which is why the advertising for this film is such a mess. Also, you just had to put this scene in the movie. It's gonna haunt me for the rest of my life. And that's unforgivable. Three out of 10, it was okay. So a big shout out to this video sponsor, ExpressVPN. I personally believe that every person should have a VPN service. And the best one out there by a long shot is ExpressVPN. It's a really great tool that gives you private and more secure access to the internet. And it also secures a connection and encrypts your data without slowing down your computer speed. As a matter of fact, ExpressVPN is super fast and you can turn it on with a tap of a button. Yeah, take that government surveillance guy. No more tracking of the sites that I visit. Oh wait, not, not that one. You also get access to server locations in over 90 countries and have full access to a variety of shows and movies that are region locked. As of late, I've been watching Studio Ghibli films on UK Netflix, plus a bunch of other anime that I can't get on American Netflix. Also, ExpressVPN can keep you safe from DDoS attacks while you're playing video games. Legit, it's a smart way to protect your IP address from thieves. Plus, ExpressVPN is the number one VPN service rated by TechRadar. It's super intuitive to use and works on multiple devices, such as Windows, Android, and iOS to name a few. For less than $7 a month, you can get the service. Trust me, that is totally worth the cost of having this amount of protection and freedom. So go to expressvpn.com slash saberspark to take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months for free.